Uh, so yeah, so uh, hi, I'm Sean, and uh, this is the Limerick Post Show. And today's what on today's show, I have Councillor uh, Conor Sheehan, representative of the Labour Party. And uh, uh, so, should I refer to you as Connor or Councillor? Or refer to me as Connor, please do. Okay, uh, so Connor, uh, you were in the like news, and and you've been in the news for the past uh, week or so. Or uh, before that, talking about the safe access zones for GPs. So, like, what, like, what was uh, your reasoning in being uh, voc- uh, being so vocal about this issue? Well, um, Sean, I was involved with the Together for Yes campaign in the run up to the referendum to repeal the Eighth Amendment in two thousand and eighteen. And the Eighth Amendment was repealed. And one of the things that we were promised in the legislation by by the then Health Minister, Simon Harris, was that safe access zones would be placed around maternity hospitals um, and places where women would receive um, abortion care. And what a safe access zone actually means is it means a set space, maybe a couple of hundred metres or whatever, around the entrance to one of these facilities, which would stop people from basically having sort of protests or vigils mm. um, or, or whatever you call them, which can be very intimidating or very and very distressing for women um, in vulnerable situations. Uh, yeah, and the Irish Council for Civil Liberties said that one, uh, one of the negatives of these protesting would mean that certain GPs might not carry out uh, these uh, medical like uh, these medical uh, activities if they are getting so much uh, negativity outside their doors and uh, that's that, that's well, exactly it and there's mm-hmm. a concern there as well like around the right to privacy and women who mm-hmm. are accessing um, healthcare have the right to access it in privacy and mm-hmm. with dignity and the right to privacy is in the constitution and that is being infringed by these protests and we need to protect women um in these situations who who need to access and it's not just even women accessing um you know uh, abortion care it's the uh, it's it's women in all sorts of situations who are accessing say limerick maternity hospital and have to pass by this Mm. uh so yeah you mentioned like a human right and like a big uh, talking point for the other side would say this, uh, that their human rights and in their constitutional rights would say that uh, limiting their right to protest would be uh, part of their... Uh, yes, but... but uh, yeah, how would you respond to like a, a talking point like that from the other side? Well, while they, while they may say that they have a right to protest um, and nobody is talking about infringing their right to progress but but there's also the right to privacy dignity um and bodily integrity and these and these and access to healthcare without discrimination Mm. Mm. um and there's also the right of medical providers to access their place of work safely as you said about the issue there with gps under article 40 of the irish constitution the the um european court of human rights the european social charter um, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and the UN Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Harm Against Women. Um, mm-hmm. And like the most important element of that is the government's oblig- obligation under the um, ICESCR to ensure safe access to medical services in privacy and with dignity. And this is in the UN um and this is something that is upheld by the UN as mm. as well. And I mean, like, the fact of the matter is, we were promised this in the original um, legislation. And like, people's right to protest does not guarantee them a right to a captive audience. Mm. Um, so the legislation would simply require them, like, they can protest if they want, they just can't do it outside or within so many hundred meters of um, a healthcare facility. Yeah, and certain uh, safe access zones have been uh, brought in and trialed in like North America and Australia and the UK. Yeah, and very. It's a common enough. It's yeah. it's common enough in other European countries as well. You know. Yeah, it's just uh, bringing it in here when it was promised. Yeah, mm. exactly. It was promised by Minister Harris um, in two thousand and eighteen. And we need to see it now, you know. Mm. 
so yeah, so like uh, you yourself have been very vocal on this and it said, um, uh, Mayor Collins said it'll be brought up in the near future. Uh, but now yeah, I am going to, I'm going to bring a motion um, to the next meeting, full meeting of the council mm. in relation to this. Yeah, so that would be like, so this, uh, this change and this fighting for like, uh, rights for uh, for lot, for various amounts of people, but obviously uh, younger people that have been uh, of years have gone past and obviously years now. Uh, you yourself have uh, been you've uh, you've put yourself out there as being a, a councillor and a representative for younger people in politics. Uh, yes. Mm. And uh, your party leader Alan Kelly said like a few weeks ago that part of the COVID like uh, coverage of COVID has been had like a, a, the treatment of younger people in COVID has been very uh, detrimental to younger people. Uh, so what, what about representing your own uh, generation, uh, generations of uh, younger than yours, do you find much of, of very uh, critical in terms of other politicians? Well, one of the reasons I got involved in politics was I felt that people my age um, and my generation were underrepresented in political life. And I felt that decisions were being made that predominantly affect people my age that were being made by people who are much older than I am. So that was one of the reasons I ran to give a voice um, to people my age. But I, I think as well that you could see as well that like COVID has made a bad situation for young people worse. Mm. Um, for example, young people work, you, most young people are in, at some stage in insecure work. So they're working in places like hospitality, um, they're working in retail. So they've either been on the front line and been un unvaccinated since the start, or they have literally been, um, or they have literally been in and out of work um you know ever since the start of the pandemic and the other thing is as well that it was recently revealed that like youth unemployment at the moment is at 59 percent mm. but that is staggering that is absolutely staggering and it's something that i don't think gets the coverage that it should like we are facing an epidemic of youth unemployment and young people in particular have suffered i think nearly the most with COVID, whether it be with things like unemployment whether it be in terms of housing or whether it be in terms of, you know, being more or less denied your civil liberties um, and being effectively um, locked at home um, for the last 15 months at what should be the prime period of your life. Mm. And on the topic of uh, youth unemployment, you were in the Limerick Post uh, last week talking about the, the pandemic unemployment payment and the impact it has on student grants. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I was I was talking uh, with uh, I talked with Simon Harris about a month and a half ago about the redevelopment of grants and uh, the impact of the new uh, refurbishment of uh, the Susie grant. Uh, so that's the, that there are a lot of trials about what, how to expand it, how to uh, how to make it more make it more accessible to a lot of people. But obviously, make, making it more accessible means that obviously means that you can't get it can't get it to everybody and uh, and part of that would be the reason that these grants are so uh, needed is because of accommodation and housing and you yourself are on the housing committee aren't you yeah yeah so they so that's so with all these grants and uh, trials and mishaps or miscommunication like it obviously affects and a key number of areas of your uh, political uh, interest being housing and young people. Yeah, it does. Uh, so, so what, what? How do you see? Well, like, what? What, what do you expect to help uh, younger people get into politics more? I think there's a couple of things. I think representation is really important because mm -hmm. I think when you see other young people involved in politics, and you see that people know that um you know when they see their peers involved in politics you see that it will be it might be possible for you to 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 to, to get involved at some point because i think if you can't see it you can't be it but i also think there needs to be supports there i mean um 
financially it can be a big barrier to mm. I mean election campaigns aren't aren't cheap particularly general election campaigns. I also think, more importantly, you need supports in terms of employment. Because unless you have an employer that is willing to leave you off work to have enough time to undertake your council work, then you're going to run into trouble because being a councillor takes up a lot more than, say, 15 or 16 hours a week. We often have meetings in the morning, meetings during the day. And unless you have an employer that's going to give you the leeway um, in order to be able to attend these meetings to discharge, you won't be able to discharge your duties properly. Mm. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, and the, the idea of attracting young people has obviously been a key point for a lot of parties uh, like Sinn Féin and the Greens have really sought to uh, expand the attraction to younger voters because of the, because of, uh, the, the attraction of the, the older generation, the older age brackets. To the more traditional parties, and I think Labour itself in the last exit poll, I think had, in terms of the eighteen to twenty fours, I think had the lowest in terms of all the parties. Yeah, uh, well, Labour certainly has its challenges when it comes to young people, um, and a lot of that relate to legacy issues from when the party were in government, um, and things were done and decisions were made that, frankly, in my mind, uh, should not have happened. They were wrong. They were discriminant. They were discriminatory against young people. And I'm talking about cuts. I'm talking about, you know, um, increasing third level fees. But I'm talking even more significantly about um, the issue that was there in relation to um, in relation to the cuts to job seekers allowance for under 26s. Mm. And I think they are things that um, I think the Labour Party in many ways, has spent a, a, a good period of time over the last few years, particularly in the last year since Alan Kelly came in as leader, atoning for itself. Mm. And I think what needs to happen with the Labour Party now is that the Labour Party, people need, it's up to the Labour Party to prove to people that we can be trusted. Um, and that takes time. And that's what we're working very hard on at the moment. I mean, Annie Hoey, in particular, has come up with an awful lot of proposals in the last year that are very pro young people. Um, Alan Kelly has spoke at the at a great deal about a new deal for young people. Rebecca Moynihan has brought forward le legislation um in terms of um renting, in terms of renters. She spoke against the government's affordable housing bill, which do, which is does not actually create doesn't even have a definition of affordability and also Annie Hoy was the one who drafted legislation to help pay student nurses um but in in relation to all that like it is up to the Labour Party to prove that it that it and itself can be trusted uh yeah uh, thank you thank you for very much for coming on uh, Councillor Ghana Sheehan perfect uh, best of luck with your uh, safe access on policy great Thank you. Mind yourself. Thank you.